what does this airplane, this airplane, and even this airplane all have in common? Let's find out on Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machette by request. Special thanks to my friend Vic, fellow McDonnell Douglas uh, veteran, uh, for the idea for this episode. What these three airplanes have in common is that they're all fitted with something called ventral fins. And this is a, a part two, kind of a follow-up to uh, last week's episode on tall tails. If you haven't seen this episode, I have a direct link at the end of the program. Well, let's start in the beginning. And I'm starting with a seaplane because in many cases, even in the early days, ventral fins were fitted to seaplanes to offset uh, the uh, floats, the amount of drag created by the float uh, structure. And here we see a 1913 Deperdusin, French uh, winner of the Schneider Cup trophy at that uh, time. Uh, looks like a float device on the bottom of the ventral as well. But as mentioned, uh, seaplanes and float planes in particular were fitted with uh, ventral fins to offset the drag of the floats. Here we see a Lockheed Vega in that configuration. I'd mentioned the Republic Rainbow. We talked about the shape of the tail last time. And you see kind of a stub ventral fin. It really completes the curvature of the tail fin. But at high angles of attack, it provides additional stability. An airplane that, uh, another Republic airplane that had a ventral fin from the very beginning was the F-105. Here we see the YF-105A prototype, smaller vertical fin, but the ventral is pretty well established uh, all the way through to the final design. This is the YF-105B uh, seen here at Edwards Air Force Base. And it's a very distinctive tail structure. Uh, above on the dorsal, you have uh, an air intake for afterburner cooling while the ventral, as mentioned, is uh, from, the beginning, uh, from the beginning of the end of the production run, uh, the same uh, shape. Here's a good example of how the 105 ventral would uh, aid stability at high angles of attack. And uh, in the combat uh, configuration, the D model uh, and the F and G models as well, uh, the ventral fins uh, aft section was fitted with a uh, tail hook uh, to catch arresting cables uh, and barriers in the event of emergency landings. Here we see that same device on the uh, McDonnell Douglas, now Boeing T-45 Goshawk Navy trainer. In many cases, ventral fins are an integral part of the design. The uh, aircraft would not be able to fly without it. And the great airships of the 1930s, here we see the USS Macon Navy uh, Zeppelin. Uh, fitted with a ventral. It even has a crew station at the lower leading edge. Uh, in modern days, the uh, Goodyear blimp, here we see the uh, ship Columbia, uh, fitted with a, a ventral, uh, obviously for directional stability. But in many cases, the ventral fins are added to an original design, like the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter. Here we see the uh, production model with the ventral. And uh, I'm gonna show the engines of this airplane. This is a Boeing 720 uh, with the original uh, J57, what they call the straight pipe turbojet engines. And here's the airplane, uh, this is actually 707, but you notice it had the smaller, uh, shorter vertical and uh, a clean lower aft fuselage. With the advent of the uh, turbofan powered, what they were called Astrojets, uh, the 707 sported a taller vertical and a blade-like ventral fin. The intercontinental version, uh, here we see the Rolls-Royce powered model 420, uh, had a larger vertical fin. This was also partially for uh, British certification, but it added stability, especially in engine out situations. And another uh, British airliner that we see here, the Comet 4, uh, was converted into a military adaptation called the Nimrod, an anti-submarine maritime patrol aircraft uh, there were two versions. The original Nimrod uh, was uh, converted from the uh, Comet fuselage. And then the Mark II we see with upgraded engines, longer fuselage, and of course the addition of a blade type ventral fin. The Lear 23, the original Learjet, beautiful airplane, classic seen here at Van Nuys Airport in California. 
the stretch model, a Lear 35, and here we see the Air Force version, the C-21, is fitted with a blade type ventral as well. With the stretch of the Lear into the model uh, 40, 50, 60, and here we ha have the 75, uh, you see a fairly robust ventral fin uh, in a uh, inverted uh, V on the aft fuselage. If you look at some uh, international airplanes, I get a lot of comments on the channel about featuring only US built aircraft. And so we're gonna show you some uh, additional airplanes from around the world. Here we have the uh, prototype Hawker P1127 Kestrel, the, the predecessor to the Harrier. And you notice the ventral fin that's fitted there. Uh, but I want to point out that uh, in many cases, even on the same airplane, the ventral may change shape. For instance, the Hawker Siddeley AV-8A in marine markings seen here, uh, notice that the shape of the ventral is uh, like so. And on the two-seat uh, Harrier T2, uh, you notice it's an entirely different shape. We mentioned the F-105. This is the F-105B at top. And uh, this first flew in 1955. The MiG-21 first flew that same year. It's interesting to see the uh, similarity in the ventral fins. And I should point out also that even though the MiG uh, wound up with a larger uh, area in the vertical stabilizer, as you see on top, uh, the later versions had the larger uh, vertical, but the ventral uh, remained uh, pretty much the same. Uh, the Panavia Tornado doesn't have a ventral, but uh, this was mentioned in the first episode. I had a number of comments talking about uh, the, si the relative size of the vertical fin uh, on this variable geometry uh, aircraft. The Jaguar, uh, seen here with twin ventral fins, as does have the uh, Lockheed Martin F-16. And the General Dynamics F-111 or the FB-111 seen here in Strategic Air Command configuration, but a uh, interesting shape, the twin uh, ventrals, uh, similar to the uh, MiG-25. And yet the F-15 does not have ventral fins. But the F-14 does, and these were added to the original configuration for additional uh, surface area and stability. Another airplane that had uh, twin ventrals added was the uh, Vought Crusader, seen here the uh, F8U2N version at bottom with uh, fairly large uh, ventrals. But having said that, here's another Vought airplane and this uh, represents a unique configuration. This is the XF8U3 or Crusader 3 Super Crusader. And uh, what looks like an additional horizontal stabilizer at the tail right there, is actually a folding ventral fin, twin fins uh, that you see here. Uh, similar folding fin on the Lockheed YF-12. This is the interceptor version of the SR-71 Blackbird, part of the Blackbird family. But here you see not only a central folding uh, ventral fin, but twin outboard fixed ventrals as well. And yet with the SR-71, uh, another Mach 3.2 aircraft, there were no ventrals at all. And yes, you didn't think I was gonna have an episode that didn't feature a Ravel cover, did you? This is the great Jack Lenwood. Now, although not properly uh, defined as ventral fins, I did wanna talk about another airplane that had folding control surfaces, and that was the uh, North American XB-70 Valkyrie. Here we see it in the 25 degree down position and the 60, 60 degree down position. And this uh, configuration provides a unique uh, lift concept uh, for the airplane to achieve Mach 3. This is the largest aircraft ever to fly three times the speed of sound. Uh, another interesting configuration, the Boeing 747 shuttle carrier aircraft, a modified 747-100 seen here carrying the uh, shuttle Enterprise for the approach and landing tests. But you notice on the tail, it's fitted with two large outrigger vertical stabilizers. And this served a couple of different purposes. Uh, with the shuttle uh, streamlined tail cone that you see here, the first three uh, approach and landing tests out of five total were flown with the streamlined fairing. 
And that gave the uh, time for descent from launch altitude roughly in the about 23, 25,000 feet or so uh, to the lake bed took uh, just under five minutes. But on free flight four, it was the first time that that uh, tail cone was removed. And this exposed uh, dummy rocket engine exhausts which created a tremendous amount of turbulence. And so these outrigger fins served another purpose. Uh, this is my painting, Free Enterprise, and it shows the launch plus three seconds of the Enterprise uh, off the top of the 7-4. But uh, there was a tremendous amount of concern, as was told to me by uh, the 747 pilot Fitz Fulton, uh, that uh, at the time of release, the amount of turbulence from the shuttle could have uh, created enough stress on the vertical to uh, break it off the top of the airplane. And in that, in that case, uh, the outrigger fins would have provided enough directional stability to get the airplane back down on the lake bed. And that was the reason that the uh, uh, launch was made with, in this direction, aimed right at the, at the lake bed. So here we see the uh, ex dummy exhaust uh, configuration on the Enterprise and the outrigger fins you can see how that would work if, uh, if the uh, vertical had been uh, ripped free. Thankfully, that didn't happen. I should mention that compared to the uh, near five minute descent for the uh, Enterprise with the tail cone, without it, the uh, time from launch to landing was two minutes, 15 seconds. And we discussed the X-15 in the first episode, but I want to revisit this because uh, you can see here it has a a ventral that is uh, the same surface area as the vertical stabilizer. And yet the lower part of the ventral is jettisoned just before landing. Uh, you can see here the approach is flown. The ventral is jettisoned at about five or 600 feet as the gear snaps down. And then the airplane lands in this configuration. But it was determined that at the high mock flights later in the program, the airplane actually flew better without the lower ventral. And so it was launched in this configuration as well on a lot of the high speed flights. The highest speed ever achieved by the airplane was the uh, Mach 6.7 flight of the X-15A2 seen here with the white ablative coating. And uh, the lower fin has been modified yet again into what they call the stub ventral. Mounted to this was a dummy scramjet engine. They were studying uh, shockwave propagation and airflow over this device. But you can see it's quite a different look from the uh, original X-15 design. So as we see, uh, the need for ventral fins in the 50s and 60s uh, was somewhat mitigated by the digital age where digital flight control systems on airplanes like the F-117, the F-22, the B-2 bomber, and the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter uh, negated the need to have folding or fixed single or twin ventral fins. And I'd like to close with uh, this airplane. This is the uh, F-16 Vista renamed the X-62. And you notice that the uh, ventral fins are quite prominent. Uh, I should mention that I was chosen and uh, very uh, fortunate to design the color scheme for this airplane. And I wanted to make sure that those ventrals were identified. And so they are painted the way you see here. It's quite a striking uh, design. So there you have it, a look at ventral fins uh, through aviation history and uh, the different configurations and styles and why airplanes look the way they do. Special thanks to the great folks who uh, allow these presentations to happen with uh, support uh, imagery, photographs, and information. Always appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed, we'd love to have you on board. Always feel free to comment. And uh, until next time, take care. <laughs>